Hello, I am Vicki Sullivan, Professor of Political Science at Tufts University. Welcome everyone to the lecture series of the International Machiavelli Society. First of all, I'd like to recognize the other members of the organizing committee of IMS. Um, Mario DeCaro, who's here, um, Yanis Evriyanis, who is here, um, thank you, and also Sean Irwin and Gabriella Pedula. IMS seeks to facilitate dialogue among uh, scholars of Machiavelli internationally. COVID unfortunately interrupted our plans of, of convening an international conference on the thought of Machiavelli in Rome in December of 2020. IMS does have plans to hold that conference in December of 2022 if Delta and any subsequent uh, variants allows us to do so. Um, in the meantime, to facilitate this hopeful dialogue, we have sponsored webinars by internationally recognized scholars of Machiavelli. Last year, we sponsored talks by Har uh, Harvey Mansfield of Harvard University and Allison Brown, who is Emerita Professor, Royal Holloway, University of London. I would also like to acknowledge the help of Andrew L. Cuesta, administrative coordinator in the Department of Political Science at Tufts in facilitating um, and promoting these lectures. So it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Catherine Zuckert. Professor Zuckert is the Nancy Reeves Drew Professor of Political Science Emerita University of Notre Dame and visiting professor in the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership at Arizona State University. She is an extremely distinguished professor of the history of political philosophy. She has written, written widely in the field and for the purposes of this introduction, I will mention only her sole authored books, which have been exceptionally large large in ambition, scope, and impact. Her first book, Natural Right and the American Imagination, Political Philosophy in Novel Form, treated the great figures of American literature. It won the award for the best book written in philosophy and religion um, by the American Association of Publishers in 1990. Her second book is entitled Postmodern Plato's, and one can see how large it is from its subtitle. Nietzsche, Heidegger, Gadamer, Strauss, and Derrida. And that was published by the University of Chicago Press in 1996. Her book, Plato's Philosophers, The Coherence of the Dialogues, all the dialogues, um, won the R. R. Hawkins Award from the University from the Association of American Publishers for the best scholarly book published in 2009. That was also published by the University of Chicago Press. She has recently turned her attention um, to Machiavelli and published this book, uh, Machiavelli's Politics. It was published in 2007, also by the University of Chicago Press. She examines the discourses, the prints, the Florentine histories, Mondragula, Clizia, and the life of Castruccio Castracani. The French translation has recently been published under the title Le Politique selon Machiavel, published by L'Armatant. Today, her topic is what Machiavelli's prince is not, the life of Castruccio Castracani. So um, I believe um, that after Professor Zuckert's talk, we will have time for one or two questions at the end. So please use the question and answer function um, to pose your questions and then I'll read them after uh, Professor Zuckert is done. All right, my pleasure to turn it over to you, Professor Zucker. Thank you very much, Professor Sullivan, for your very generous <laughs> introduction. 
promotion, and I'm sure the publisher will be happy for the promotion. <laughs> I'd also like to thank the um, other officers of the International Machiavelli Society for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, some years ago, I published uh, an article in the history of political thought on the short, highly ironical account Machiavelli wrote of the life of Castruccio Castrocani. And in thinking about what I should present today, I concluded that an analysis of this brief somewhat comical piece could not only serve as a response to too much debated issues in the ever-growing secondary literature on Machiavelli, it would also remind us how amusing and lighthearted Machiavelli is as an author, even when he treats the most serious issues. In his account of the life of the petty tyrant who sees power in Luca, and almost conquered the Republic of Florence, Machiavelli not merely demonstrates how willing he was to alter the historical record in order to make his own points. He shows that he does not think that a military captain like Cesare Borgia or Agathocles is apt to become the founder of a popular regime as John McCormick has recently been contending. Moreover, in a rare display of his knowledge of the writings of previous philosophers, in the maxims Machiavelli attributes to Castruccio at the end of his life, Machiavelli indicates that he himself is a philosopher, but not of either the ancient Socratic or Epicurean kind. Machiavelli wrote his brief account of Castruccio's life, <coughs> I'm sorry, in somewhat unusual circumstances. Unable to obtain a position of employment in the Florentine government under the Medici, he accepted whatever jobs he could. The summer of 1520, he thus found himself in Lucca, awaiting the resolution of a bankruptcy case in which he was representing some Florentine merchants. To divert himself, he composed this thoroughly fictionalized account of the 14th century mercenary soldier who became tyrant of Luca and sent it to his young Florentine friends, Zanobi, Bundamonti, and Luigi Alamanni. The known Republican sympathies and family connections of Machiavelli's young friends make it unlikely that they would have taken a mercenary captain who had not only made himself tyrant of his own city, but had also tried to deprive Florence of her liberty as an exemplar of political excellence. But unlike many later scholars, Machiavelli's young friends seem to have seen the point of his historical inventions. Zenobi wrote Machiavelli that they had read the life as a model for the history of Florence. They were lobbying Cardinal Giulio de' Medici to commission Machiavelli to write, which as you know, he did. By demonstrating how he could critique, by seeming to praise, in his brief account of Castruccio's life, Machiavelli showed his young friends how he could write a history of Florence that would appear to celebrate Medici achievements, but would reveal the defective, if not pernicious character of their rule. Machiavelli praises Castruccio with what the historical record shows, <laughs> sorry, by contrasting, I skipped a lot, by contrasting the qualities and deeds for which Machiavelli praises Castruccio with what the historical record shows he actually did and said, facts Machiavelli's young friends were apt to have known, but which we later scholars have to look up, readers see the difference between what Machiavelli thought a truly fortunate and virtuous prince would do and a petty tyrant. The distinctive character of Machiavelli's account of the life of the young tyrant of Luca becomes clearer if we contrast it briefly with earlier versions. He was a well-known character. Castruccio's contemporaries, the Florentine chronicler Villani and the Pisan Dominican poet Bronte, had presented Castruccio as an embodiment of the vigor, skill, and valor they found lacking in their own cities. He was described as a shrewd but just ruler in tales by Petrarch, Sacchetti, and Calvacati. But Castruccio's fellow Lucans tended to view him as a tyrant of whom they were happy to be rid. 
the late 15th century Lucan novelist, Nicola Tigrini was a notable exception. He presented his city's most famous prince as a model of ancient virtue and nobility. But in order to do so, he had to embroider or even alter the facts in his depiction of the three basic stages of Castruccio's life. First, Tigrini made a great deal of Castruccio's family. To indicate his hero's noble ancestry, he followed the example of the historical character who added Antel Manelli to his name after his ascension to power. In fact, the Castracani were a recently established minor branch of the Antel Manelli family who engaged in the somewhat disreputable practice of money lending. And to make his hero more like the great figures of antiquity, the Greeny invented a story about Castruccio's miraculous birth. Having fallen asleep exhausted by her labor, Castruccio's mother dreamed that a great fire blazed up from within her body that consumed her and everything around her. Awakened by her fright, she gave birth. And the injuries she suffered in giving birth to so a large infant, maybe nine pounds, made her unable to bear any more children. Nevertheless, Tegrini emphasized Castruccio himself fathered a large family, including nine legitimate and two natural children. And the novelist extolled the way in which Castruccio educated them by example, as well as by precept. He claimed that Castruccio was sober and continent, displayed a particular devotion to St. Francis and inculcated the stoical habits of a scholar in his sons, none of which is true according to the historical record. Second, in tracing his hero's rise to power, the novelist embroidered a Chronicles report that Castruccio had played a significant part in the Battle of Monte Catini by claiming that the Lucan had led the troops to victory in the absence of their captain, Uccione della Fagiola. The Grimi particularly praised his hero's ability to inspire his troops by speaking to them as well as his strategic intelligence and organizational skill. In general, the Grimi showed Castruccio to be a ruler concerned about the welfare of his people, who regularly sought the advice of wise, learned men and hated flatterers. Perhaps because he himself was uneducated, the Grimi also reported that Castruccio would from time to time utter a maxim he had invented or took from classical sources. Finally, in depicting Castruccio's legacy, Degrini has the Lord of Lucca give a deathbed speech in which he says he is dying poor in possessions, but rich in glory, and reminds his son that the aim of a ruler should be the welfare and security of his subjects. It did not matter to the novelist's evaluation of Castruccio's life and deeds that the empire he seized by force and fraud did not last. Machiavelli followed Segrimi's example, both by organizing his account of Castruccio's life into the same three stages and making it into a work of fiction. However, Although he incorporated many of his predecessors' inventions, Machiavelli used them to show that Castruccio was not the exemplar of the rather traditional set of princely virtues to Grimi had depicted. First, with regard to Castruccio's birth. Instead of emphasizing Castruccio's noble lineage, Machiavelli presents the Lucan prince as a foundling who was educated by two sets of adoptive parents. To anyone who considers the matter Machiavelli observes, it appears quite amazing that all, or at least most of those who have achieved outstanding things in the story have suffered to an unusual degree from the travails of fortune. They have been exposed to wild beasts or have had such humble fathers that feeling ashamed of them, they have made themselves out to be sons of Jupiter or some other God. Machiavelli refrains from giving examples. Since their names are familiar to everyone, he explains listing them would be tedious and undesirable to the reader. 
But the story Machiavelli proceeds to tell of Dionora's finding the babe wrapped in grape leaves in her brother's vineyard and of Castruccio's subsequent adoption by the mercenary captain, Messer Francesco Dini, cannot help but remind readers of the biblical account of Pharaoh's daughter finding Moses in the bulrushes and Herodotus's report of the way King Astyages recognized his son Cyrus by the boy's regal bearing in a mock battle with other ruffians. Although Machiavelli's account of his birth and nurture make Castruccio resemble two of the mythical founders of ancient kingdoms, he celebrates in chapter six of The Prince. He does not present Castruccio as their equal. In The Prince, Machiavelli declares that the virtue of those who rise to power on the basis of their own abilities is so great that fortune gives them only the opportunity. That is, quoting a translation, the matter enabling them to introduce any form they please. And the opportunities he attributes to Moses and Cyrus consist in the enslavement or oppression of their peoples from which these founder heroes freed them. Machiavelli never suggests that Castruccio liberated Lucca or the other Tuscan cities he ruled as a tyrant. Whereas Machiavelli does say that the Pistons who drove out Castruccio's lieutenants restored liberty to the city. Machiavelli explicitly presents Castruccio's humble birth and adoption as illustrations of the power of fortune, who, and again I quote, wishing to demonstrate to the world that it is she who makes men brave, not prudence, begins to show her powers at a time when prudence can play no part at all, like we get born. However, Machiavelli also indicates the limits of the power of fortune to make an individual great, as well as the limits of his own praise of Castruccio. When he adds, Castruccio's achievements were outstanding for the times in which he lived and the city in which he was born. At that time, Italy was divided into many cities and Luca was a relatively small one. Second, just as he began by presenting Castruccio's birth in the guise of that of a legendary founder, but then indicated that neither his nurture nor his achievements were all that extraordinary. So in the second part of his account of Castruccio's life, Machiavelli presents an improved and enhanced picture of Castruccio's rise to power, only to undercut his exemplary status at the end. According to Machiavelli, Castruccio first demonstrated his military prowess when Messer Francesco put Castruccio in charge of the company he sent to aid the Visconti of Milan. Castruccio displayed so much prudence and courage in that campaign that he returned to Lucca with a reputation in all Lombardy. But what aroused the envy and opposition of his fellow citizens was not his ability to fight foreign wars. It was the favor Messer Francesco showed Castruccio at home by choosing him to be the tutor of his 13 year old son Pacolo and to administer his estate after he died. The head of the Guelph party in Lucca, Messer Giorgio de Pisi, had hoped to seize, seize power in Lucca after Messer Francesco's death. So to discredit his new Ghibelline competitor, Pisi began spreading rumors about Castruccio's intentions to establish a tyranny. However, Instead of immediately seeking to become a tyrant himself, as a piece of charge, Castruccio became a lieutenant of the mercenary captain, Uguccione della Fagiola. Uguccione made himself captain and then lord of Pisa and was allied with the Ghibellines. And as his lieutenant, Castruccio conspired with his friends in Lucca, not merely to bring back Ghibelline exiles in Pisa, but to make Uguccione Lord of Lucca. Having provided himself with weapons and other supplies necessary to hold out for several days. At a prearranged signal, Castruccio called the citizens to arms and opened the gates of the city to Uguccione and his troops. 
The mercenary captain then killed the leaders of the Guelph party in Lucca and reorganized the government to suit himself with much injury to other Lucans. Exaggerating the role Castruccio played in establishing a foreign mercenary captain in charge of Lucca, Machiavelli adopts to Grinemi's alteration of the historical record, but by making Castruccio lead Guccione's troops to victory when they met the Florentine army amassed at Montecchini. According to Machiavelli, Castruccio's military success led Guccione to become jealous and suspicious. So when Castruccio resisted the arrest of a murderer who had sought refuge with him, Guccione had the pretext he desired to act against his lieutenant. He ordered his son Nere, whom he had left in charge of Luca, to invite Castruccio to dinner and then to seize and imprison him. Afraid the people would rebel if he killed such a popular hero without a trial, Neri sent to his father for further instructions. And exasperated by his son's ineptitude, Uguccione left Pisa to march to Lucca with 400 cavalry, whereupon the Pisans rebelled. And hearing about the rebellion in Pisa, the Lucans did as well. They freed Castuccio, and he and his friends then attacked Uguccione, who fled to Lombardy. From a traitor, Castruccio had transformed himself into the liberator of Luca. With the help of his friends and his newly won popular favor, he was first made general for a year. But Machiavelli reports, Castruccio did not take advantage of the opportunity to solidify the support of his people. Anxious to obtain the title as well as control of the city, he bribed several members of outstanding families to make him Lord. And they arranged for him to be proclaimed Prince for life by a solemn decree of the people. After he was proclaimed Lord of Lucca, Machiavelli shows that the Castruccio set out immediately to extend his dominion. He first sought to enhance his reputation by making the Holy Roman Emperor his friend. He took 500 cavalry to meet Frederick of Bavaria as he traveled to Rome to be crowned. Frederick of Bavaria is actually a combination of two historical figures. And this gesture redounded immediately to Castruccio's benefit. Having driven their Lord out, the Pisans had asked the emperor for existence. But since he intended to return to Germany, the emperor made Castruccio Lord of Pizza. Pretty nice gift. After the emperor returned to Germany, Machiavelli reports, all the Tuscan and Lombard Ghibellines turned to Castruccio for assistance, promising him rule of their states if he managed to return their states to them. His ambition thus excited and expanded, Castruccio decided to try to become Lord of all Tuscany with the help of his Ghibelline allies and his own arms. Observing that Castruccio first organized his own army by dividing Lucca and its territory into five parts, providing the inhabitants with weapons and putting them under captains and instant. Machiavelli shows Castruccio doing just what he had praised Cesare Borgia for doing in The Prince. Shifting from the unreliable auxiliary and mercenary troops he had first used to seize power to organizing his own arms. However, although he organized and armed his people, Machiavelli also shows that Castruccio did not seek their support or that of the Luca nobles. As Castruccio admits in his deathbed speech, he did not try to consolidate his power at home before he sought additional foreign acquisitions. On the contrary, following the model of his acquisition of Pisa, from the Emperor, Holy Roman Emperor, Castruccio again tried to enhance his reputation further by aligning with a powerful foreign Ghibelline, Messer Matteo Visconti, Prince of Milan. When Matteo asked Castruccio to attack Florence, so the Florentines would have to bring their troops back from Lombardy to Tuscany, Castruccio gladly complied. 
The Stutus soon had to withdraw his troops, however, in order to put down a conspiracy at home. Just as Castruccio's rising reputation in Lucca had aroused the envy of the LPC family, so his imperial connections and ambitions aroused the envy of his former allies, the Poggio family. Complaining that he had not given them their fair share of the rewards, they conspired against him. Although a peace-loving member of that family tried to mediate, Castruccio did not spare him. When, following the example of the Guccione and his son Neri, as well as that of Cesare Borgia and Grotto, he invited the whole family to dinner and executed or imprisoned them all. Castruccio then sought to eliminate any individual who might harbor an ambition to become prince in his stead. Like Agathocles the Sicilian, as Machiavelli reports in chapter nine of The Prince, Castruccio demonstrated his ability to use both force and fraud to seize and maintain control of his city for the duration of his life. But Machiavelli proceeds to show that Gertrude was not sufficient to enable him to found a lasting empire or to win glory. Attempting again to expand his dominion, Castruccio acquired control of Pistoian by promising the leaders of both the white and black wealth factions that he would assist them in putting down the opposition. But once he and his troops were led into the city, he killed the heads, captured the supporters of both factions and persuaded the populace to surrender. Castruccio would thus seem to have acted according to the advice Machiavelli gives men who acquire rule by means of fortune or by crime. But after he seized Pistoia, Castruccio again sought to increase his international reputation rather than solidify support for his truth, for his rule among his fellow citizens and subjects by responding to a plea from a lieutenant of the Holy Roman Empire to help him put down a rebellion in Rome. By having grain shipped in from Sicily and so removing the major cause of popular unrest, Castruccio appeared to have understood the importance of gaining popular support by preserving the lives and property of the people while restraining the great, as Machiavelli recommends in chapter nine of The Prince. However, just as he had squandered his opportunity to build a reputation as the liberator and savior of the people of Lucca in order to obtain the title of prince as quickly as possible, so in Rome, Castruccio immediately began to flaunt his imperial ambitions. Having been made a senator, he went strutting around in a white toga embroidered in gold, which said on the front, God wills it, and on the back, what God wills will be. And this is flaunting of his imperial ambitions aroused the suspicion and hostility of a more powerful neighbor, the Republic of Florence. Fearing the loss of their own liberty, Machiavelli reports in both the Florentine histories and his life to Castruccio Castracani, the Florentines offered to make Robert, King of Naples, Lord of their city, if he would defend them. Robert agreed to send his son, Charles of Calabria, for a fee to near 200,000 florins per year, but it took him some time to arrive. In his account of the life of Castruccio Castracani, Machiavelli explains that the Florentines were able to assemble not merely one, but two huge armies to oppose Castruccio. He defeated the first, but was forced to withdraw his troops from their territory in order to put down a conspiracy against him in Pisa, same old story. And in the second encounter of their army, both he and the Florentine general were killed. Both the battles Machiavelli describes between Castruccio and the Florentines in his life are fabrications. Different locations, strategies taken from um, CPO and ancient generals that Machiavelli recommends in the art of war. In fact, Castruccio's army did camp within two miles of the walls of Florence and ravaged the countryside after he defeated the Florentines. 
in his Florentine histories, Machiavelli attributes the Florentine losses to the dilatory tactics employed by their hired commander and the political divisions within the city. Machiavelli concludes that account, moreover, by observing that Florence was saved only by good fortune when both Castruccio and Charles died. In his life of Castruccio Castracani, Machiavelli presents the Lucan captor as a much better military leader than he actually was and attributes his, his death to a certain lack of foresight rather than sheer bad luck. In relating the way in which Castruccio's career came to an abrupt end at the conclusion of the battle with the second army of the Florentines mustered against him, Machiavelli seems to attribute Castruccio's failure to realize his imperial ambitions to bad luck and thus to return to what appeared to be the primary theme of the life at the beginning, that is the power of fortune. Because he believed that a captain should be first to mount and last to dismount, Machiavelli reports, Castruccio stood in a wind, exhausted and drenched in perspiration to greet his victorious troops on their return, as well as to look and see whether the enemy had regrouped and would attack. As a result, he came down with a fever and died. Castruccio may have wanted to show his men what a good, effective and caring captain he was, but his resolve to remain standing in the wind, bareheaded and perspiring, and so to risk his becoming ill, indicates that his death was not simply a result of bad luck. Like Cesare Borgia in The Prince, Machiavelli first attributes Castruccio's inability to establish a lasting regime to his own untimely death. But as Machiavelli states explicitly in the case of Cesare, so he implicitly suggests in his life of Castruccio Castricani, the captain's failure to establish a lasting regime in Luca was ultimately a result of his bad judgment. That bad judgment is further revealed in, two part, in the two parts of his legacy that Machiavelli relates in the third part of his account of Castruccio's life. The deathbed speech Machiavelli invents for Castruccio to give to his imaginary adopted heir and the 34 state sayings that Machiavelli attributes to him. As he lay dying, Machiavelli claims, Castruccio told his adopted son and heir, Paolo, that if he had thought fortune would want to cut him off in the midst of his path towards glory, promised by his many successes, he would have tried to do less. Content to rule Luca and Pisa, he would not have conquered Pistoia and angered Florentines. He would then have bequeathed a smaller but more secure state to Pagolo, who would have had fewer enemies and be less envied by his fellow citizens and subjects. Castruccio acknowledges that he has left Pagolo in a difficult position, but he prides himself on telling Pagolo how to deal with it. Having observed that Pagolo is not suited to war when he accompanied Castruccio to battle, Castruccio advises his adopted son to endeavor to use arts of peace. He tells Pagolo not to count on the support of his rebellious subjects or distant allies. Instead, he should rely on his own cleverness and the Florentines' memory of their recent defeat by trying to make peace with them. Machiavelli does not explicitly comment on the wisdom of Castruccio's death advice. He merely informs his readers that neither virtue nor fortune was as friendly to Pago as they had been to Castruccio. People soon lost, sorry, Pagolo soon lost everything Castruccio had left him, except for Luca. That city alone remained in his family for two generations. If we review Machiavelli's account of Castruccio's rise to power and Pagolo's role in it, however, we see that Castruccio had done nothing to teach his unwarlike son the arts of peace. 
which Machiavelli identifies with religion in his praise of Numa in Discourses. Castruccio had not reversed his own experience and given his ear to a priest to teach him what his father had refused to learn from the priest who birthed Bocumen. Nor had Castruccio imitated Mr. Francesco's prudent policy by finding a young man with a suitable nature to adopt and educate, who would be able to lead his troops when he himself was no longer able to do so. Castruccio told Pagolo that he thought he was on the path toward glory promised by his many successes. But Machiavelli shows Castruccio did not understand what is required to achieve the glory he sought. His failure to find and educate an heir meant that he would not have an, a success, an effective successor or succession. Moreover, in order to acquire glory, Machiavelli argues in both the Prince and Discourses, a leader must not only satisfy the desires of his fellow citizens or subjects to preserve their lives and properties. He must also appear to be merciful, faithful, honest, humane, and religious. But as the sayings Machiavelli attributes to Castruccio at the end of his life show, Castruccio was not concerned about appearing to be moral or religious, merciful or faithful. Let me turn now to the long list of maxims taken largely from Diogenes Laertes, which Machiavelli attributes in a slightly modified form to Castruccio at the end of his life. Like his first young Florentine reader, most later commentators have either ignored or dismissed these sayings. But as a result, they have missed not only an important part of Machiavelli's critique of the Lucan prince for his lack of practical wisdom, they have also ignored Machiavelli's indications of his own objections to ancient philosophy, both Platonic and Epicurean. All the ancient philosophers from whom Castruccio takes his maxims were students of Socrates. But these were students critical of the Platonic notion of the ideas. They did not posit such transcendental, purely intelligible objects of knowledge or standards of right and wrong. But they did all recognize a fundamental difference between nature and convention and use this difference to criticize conventional morality, customs, and laws. In attributing these sayings to Castruccio, Machiavelli adapts them to his protagonist's time and circumstances. For example, by substituting celebrations of saints' feast days for the festivals of the gods in the original versions. Machiavelli also makes the sayings conform to his protagonist's position by identifying Castruccio with the ty tyrant Dionysus rather than with the philosopher Aristippus in their exchanges. Nevertheless, even though Machiavelli modifies the sayings to fit Castruccio's particular circumstances, a comparison of Castruccio's sayings with the originals indicates that he did not recognize the fundamental tension between his own political concerns and the explicitly apolitical stance taken by these ancient Socratics. One of the very few, if not the only commentator to pay attention to the maxims at the end of Machiavelli's life of Castruccio Castracani, Leo Strauss points out that the last set of sayings drawn from Diogenes begin with a reference to Castruccio's education by Messer Francesco. Asked by a comrade what he would want in exchange for letting himself be slapped, Castruccio replied, as did Diogenes, a helmet. As a youth, Machiavelli shows his readers, Castruccio had learned the importance of being able to defend himself from harm inflicted by others. That lesson led him to engage in politics, in contrast to the cynical philosophers whose sayings he had appropriated. In repeating the sayings of Aristippus and Diogenes, Machiavelli thus has Castruccio omit the explicitly anti-political parts. The Lord of Lucca was proud of his political position and certainly did not want to disown it. However, 
by repeating the sayings of these anti-political philosophers as his own views, Castruccio showed that he did not understand the tension between their understanding of the world and his own political concerns. Most important, Castruccio did not understand why a prince who cannot always be merciful, honest, humane, and religious must nevertheless always seek to appear to be so, especially to be religious. For example, Machiavelli reports, borrowing from the infamously atheistic philosopher Bion, Castru sorry, Castruccio used to say that the path to hell was easy since you went down with your eyes closed. And when Castruccio was asked if he had thought about taking up the cloth to save his soul, he responded by modifying the cynic Diogenes' statement about Alcibiades, that he had not, since it seemed strange to him that Brother Lazarus, the beggar at the rich man's banquet in the New Testament, should go to heaven and be rewarded, while Guccione, the mercenary captain and tyrant Cast Castruccio had served, should go to hell no rewards in the afterlife. Strauss suggests that in relating Castruccio's embrace and restatement of these sayings by the unsung and undignified atheistic philosophers, Machiavelli was expressing his own innermost thought in an ironical, that is, in a disassembling manner. By attributing the maxims to Castruccio, Machiavelli could evade responsibility for restating them while nevertheless repeating them. But the innermost thought Strauss attributes to Machiavelli goes beyond a declaration of atheism and a desire to protect himself from persecution for that atheism. By placing the one maxim taken from Aristotle between two pairs of sayings by the infamous atheist Bion, Strauss argues, Machiavelli points to a thought at the center of which Aristotle is kept in bonds or overwhelmed by Bion. And that thought goes far beyond the atheism of Bion, as well as the contempt for convention exhibited by Aristippus and Diogenes, who saying surround those taken from Bion, surrounding the one from Aristotle, it's a shell structure. In contradistinction to Aristippus and Diogenes, Strauss concludes, Machiavelli is a political philosopher, a man concerned with the good society, but he understands the good society starting from the conventionalist assumption, from the premise of extreme individualism. Man is not by nature directed towards political society. According to Strauss, Machiavelli thus achieves a synthesis of the two classical traditions by going over to a new plane from the plane on which all classical thought moves. What is that synthesis and new plane? In marked contrast to Aristotle, but like Aristippus, Aristippus and Diogenes, Machiavelli denies that human beings are by nature political. Their fear and consequent desire to acquire naturally bring them into conflict. And when they no longer fight from necessity, they fight from ambition. As Machiavelli emphasizes in his treatment of the early Roman kings and discourses three, chapters two through six, both erotic and familial affection are over overcome in both men and women by a much stronger desire for domination. However, in contrast to Aristippus and Diogenes, as well as to Aristotle, Machiavelli does not take nature, nature as a guide or standard to the best human life. He is not a hedonist like Aristippus who seeks to maximize his pleasure or minimize his pain, nor an anti-conventionalist like Diogenes who seeks to live solely in accord with nature. Machiavelli seeks to show his readers how using their intelligence and experience, they can invent conventions and laws that is, a new kind of political order, which will enable human beings to overcome their natural condition of scarcity and weakness, and enable most, if not all of them, to feel secure in their lives, families, and properties. 
the new plane upon which Machiavelli creates a, a synthesis of the two classical traditions is a new conception of nature. Nature is hostile to human happiness, but as Machiavelli states in print six, a source of matter to be shaped, directed and trained by means of a human art, the political art to improve the human condition. Machiavelli's own words and deeds often appeared to be as irreligious and as immoral as Castruccio's. He once famously wrote that he cared more about his fatherland than his soul. He was not often seen in church and he was known to have engaged in many extramarital affairs. But in contrast to Castruccio, Machiavelli was keenly aware of the political power and uses of religion. In Prince 18, he tells his reader that an effective ruler cannot always be religious, especially if he's a new ruler, but that he must always seek to appear to be so. Machiavelli is particularly critical of the founders of the monastic orders by teaching their followers not to expect justice in this world, but to seek it in the next, he argues in Discourses 3.1, Christian monks have left the world to be plundered and ruled by the wicked. In the case, both of the monastic orders and the teachings they propagated, however, Machiavelli is particularly critical of the combination of Christianity with contemplative philosophy. In Discourses 2.2, he explicitly states that the feminizing results of the Christian religion are products of a particular pernicious, lazy interpretation. As he indicated in his description of King Ferdinand of Spain and Prince 21, Christianity could be interpreted differently so that it would not be merely compatible with, but would be supportive of political and military orders. The one form of human activity to which Machiavelli consistently shows indifference, if not outright hostility, is contemplative philosophy. As Strauss points out, Machiavelli refers on more than one occasion to Xenophon's political writings, but never to his depiction of Socrates as the philosophical alternative to the political life. I disagree, however, with Strauss's conclusion, namely that Machiavelli argued that political life should be devoted not to the education of virtuous individuals, but to the uh, acquisition of the goods desired by the many, life, security, and prosperity, in order to save philosophy. I think Machiavelli meant what he explicitly ordered, argued, that the establishing and maintaining of a government, which enables each of the two opposed humors into which he thought every political society divides to check the excesses of the other, and thus secure the liberty of all, including the liberty of a thinker like Machiavelli, is both the most urgent necessity and the closest possible approximation of the common good of everyone, as he states at the beginning of his discourses. That was his project, the new modes and orders he hoped his young readers and followers would establish because he himself could not. The mercenary captain who became tyrant of Luca was clearly not a model any more than Cesare Borgia or Agathocles was of Machiavelli's founder prince. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Zucker. Um, this lecture, I think, has lived up to your other endeavors that I mentioned um, in introducing you with respect to your, your sole authored uh, books, uh, you have covered so much territory. Um, you showed how um, Machiavelli um, change, works within the tradition of these treatments of Castruccio, but changes them. You, you showed how Machiavelli um, is able to appear to praise um, while actually offering trenchant criticism and then you were able to treat um, what you regard as Machiavelli's ultimate intentions um, in differing from 
the prior schools of classical thought. So it was, it's really quite an accomplishment. Um, we do have a question from Sean Irwin, who says this, um, thank you for your wonderful talk. My question concerns the relationship of successful captains and new princes you mentioned as an issue a couple of times. As you explained clearly, Castruccio is not the equal of Moses, Cyrus, Romulus, and Theseus. Still, Prince Six refers as well to Hero at the end who has a certain proportion with them. Hero bears a close resemblance to Castruccio in having arms of his own in the form of Syracusian mercenaries and possessing new powerful foreign friends, i.e the uh, Republican Romans for whom he acted as its most reliable ally. Hero also failed in the end by choosing as his successor, his grandson, Hieronymus. He too failed at the arts of peace. The success at the arts of peace, talking with God, play a part in transforming a captain into a prince or more. Is a captain who shows success at that, um, like Sertarius and Sulla at the end of Art of War, book four, in effect, um, no longer a captain. Should I? Should I? <laughs> okay. Should I? <laughs> I'll reread the last the last paragraph. Okay. Um, okay. Um, what, <laughs> I'm really but, testing my memory. I yeah, I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Professor Here. Irwin knows, um, knows his Machiavelli. Does success <laughs> at the arts of peace, that is talking with God, play a part in transforming a captain into a prince or more? Is a captain who shows success at that, like Sertorius and Sulla at the end of Art of War book four, in effect, no longer a captain? So if you, if one is successful in that, does one sort of, I guess, transcend the office of captain? Okay, so I just have to admit, I'm sorry to say that I do not remember the end of part four of the Arts of War well enough to um, comment on it. So this will be, a, a, you know, unfortunately a too general question. Um, Relying on the discourses and the treatment there of Romulus and Numa, I would say, um, Machiavelli, I think, actually doubts that any one individual can pull this off. Um, and he, when he talks about um, Caesar warning against Caesar, actually, and discourses 110, he observes that, well, Caesar's reputation depended on his successors. And Caesar actually couldn't control those successors. So I think um, Machiavelli's more considered view is indicated by his praise of Republic um, in Discourses 120 when he says, well, the advantage of a Republic is that it's not stuck with one leader. Um, a Republic can um, elect one individual, he would think a man, who suited to one time and when the times change, then the Republic or he fails, the Republic can substitute another. That is um, historical reputation or glory is, isn't really within the control of the individual. And Machiavelli is actually very clear in the Princeton Discourses about it's impossible for any one individual to be both very warlike and very peaceful at once. So I think that these are different roles. What can happen though, is that an individual like Machiavelli can understand the necessity for both. And so, and can understand that um, there are lots of things that he can't control, but um, someone in power could be concerned about educating his successor. Um, Castruccio shows no such concern. Um, Machiavelli pros, praises Romulus in one of his um, many, many, many changes of the history um, to say, <laughs> he showed that he was founding a Republic in effect by 
letting the Senate have a voice by creating a Senate. So he creates a new institution and that institution takes some of the responsibility or opens up the possibility for combining these different needs. And in fact, I, mean, I guess I take Machiavelli's very general um, stance to be because human life always involves the conflict of different desires and forces. Um, you're never going to have, strictly speaking, a stable order. You're going to have laws that channel these forces, but you constantly are gonna to have to invent new institutions and new policies to keep them in balance. Um, so I think what Machiavelli ultimately um, criticizes Castruccio for, as well as many other historical leaders, is not understanding the needs, not only of their own position, but how to perpetuate what they tried to found or establish. Great, terrific. Um, if I may, um, I'd like, oh, uh, Professor DeCaro, you have your hand up. Um, no, uh, please go, Vicky. I can wait. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, maybe while I'm asking the question and Professor Zuckert is responding, um, you can um, uh, display your your camera. Turn on your camera um, <laughs> so people can see you. Um, so my question is is this? Um, well, I'm I'm wondering whether Professor Zuckert, you can elaborate on um, your observation that Machiavelli is distinctive um, in as an author in treating the most serious matters in a lighthearted fashion. And I'm wondering how and if that relates to um, your understanding of his philosophical position um, and his new understanding of, of nature. I guess I would see it as, as um, related in the following way. I mean, Machiavelli is famously known to have signed, I think it's one of his letters that uh, tra Machiavelli tragico comico um, historico. So he saw all of these <laughs> ways of viewing human life as, as being related. And I think that he took um, or absorbed all of them. So um, it, his comical stance is, an ironic stance, and I, you know, in the um, in the prologue to Mandragora, you know, he says, "Well, I'm really mad at the people and the way that they've treated me, and I can be as nasty as anybody else." Um, that he wasn't going to give over to despair or tears. I mean, he you know, didn't exactly have a happy life in all respects um, because he saw there was an opportunity for changing things for the better. Um, but I guess my own view of his view of nature, which in the ancient alternatives is more Epicurean than surely than Platonic um, or Aristotelian is that everything's in motion. Everything is going to change. So, you know, everything's transitory in a way you have no choice but to live for the moment, but you can at least be wise enough to see that it is the moment and you can try to seize it and do something about it. I'm not sure I would go so far as to say that he's distinctive in taking a kind of comic stance. I think there are other philosophers who also see things as more comic than tragic, but that's at least why I think Machiavelli wrote comedies and not tragedies. Right. Thank you. Uh, Professor DeCaro. Oh yeah, thank you very much. That was uh, really, really interesting. I haven't read the, the Castruccio Castragani's life for many years. So uh, you gave me a lot of, I will read it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a good student. Yeah. <laughs> One thing that is interesting, uh, just the premise that, you know, we tend to, of course, I, I, at least me, tend to see, you know, these Florentine stories or Tuscan stories as close to each other. But actually, between Machiavelli and Castruccio Castragani, there was the same time gap that there is between us and Napoleon. So <laughs> a lot of time had passed. And then we should consider that probably these were, you know, facts that were, you know, very, very 
very, very um, legendary almost, right? That's so much time had passed. But that, that is a question. So um, similarly to uh, uh, Cesare Borgia, Castruccio probably, uh, according to Machiavelli, if I understand, uh, uh, made a, some mistakes in judgment that were uh, fatal for him. And, uh, and one thing that seems to me possible that, you know, you cannot change your, your um, attitude at temper so much. And probably he was an, very good at peacetime as he was in, a, in, a, in a, a war time. Still, uh, he missed one thing that probably uh, uh, could have helped, the knowledge of history. Because this is something Machiavelli stresses a lot. If a potential prince or a prince knows what happened to his predecessors as uh, 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 princes or uh, military figures, they would do much better. So in one word, probably Castruccio missed a, a personal Machiavelli to help him uh, in making better judgments. I don't know if you agree with that. I agree actually with both parts of that. That's, that's a wonderful um, comment, so, so thank you. So first, Castruccio clearly didn't have an advisor, whether he would have recognized um, the need for such or the wisdom of somebody like Machiavelli. I guess I, I tend a, a little bit to discount. I mean, I, I don't know what to make of Tigrini's saying, I mean, um, that she listened to wise people because there doesn't seem to be anything in the description of his life that says, you know, he had these friends, et cetera. Um, but your second point also is I think a really important point about Machiavelli and I think I didn't put enough emphasis on that. I mean, so two parts. One is even though Machiavelli is not an accurate historian, I mean, I just, you know, he changes things all the time. He still encourages people to study history. Um, and he uses, he mines history for examples. So he doesn't, I mean, that's a part, I mean, he doesn't encourage people to study philosophy. Um, and I, you know, literature is kind of ambiguity. So yes, he, he thinks that's human experience and the record thereof. And you, you know, so I think he could have said, yeah, you're doomed to make the same mistakes if you don't learn about them and, and think, then you have to think about them. Why was that a mistake? Or why did that work? Um, and that's what Machiavelli is, I think, modeling. Um, and that's, I think, what he wanted um, the people, I guess we would call the elite, the ones who are trying to educate in universities. That's what they ought to be learning. And are they? Not so sure. Terrific. So he's he's simultaneously changing the form of education. Um, we have, I think, um, our last question now, and it's from Catherine Robiadek, who thanks you, Professor Zuckert, for a wonderful analysis. And then she goes on to ask this. I am interested to hear you talk more about the fascinating invention by Machiavelli of a new understanding of nature itself. Could you say more about what nature is then for Machiavelli? And in broad terms, what does this new conceptualization of nature mean for both fortune and virtue, <laughs> as mentioned being important for describing Castruccio's life? Okay, um, that's a big question, <laughs> the, the whole, um, but um, I haven't seen um, Katie for a while, so I'm glad to hear from her. Uh, okay, the understanding of nature. Um, Machiavelli certainly doesn't present himself as a traditional student of nature or as a philosopher in that way. Um, so just to begin with the obvious, but it seems to me the obvious is very significant. Machiavelli talks about the human things, and I think he moves to everything. I mean, I'd actually say this is not just true of Machiavelli, it's true of Plato too, but Machiavelli definitely moves to observations of things through human observations and through human concerns. Um, 
and I th I think um, that he has some doubts about whether we have any knowledge of things that's not like that. So moving to the observation of nature, not by beginning with the inanimate or the unmoving, but beginning with what we know about ourselves, always needy, always desiring, always feeling passionate, having concerns, learning some things, forgetting some things too. Um, his is, is a view that has some classical roots and uh, which I think he could have found um, in by reading Lucretius of nature as everything is always in motion. There's nothing eternal. Um, and that could be a very sad picture of nature. Um, on the other hand, Machiavelli sees the potential of if there's nothing eternal, but there's also nothing that necessarily always confines us. So Machiavelli doesn't talk a lot about his view of nature per se. He talks much more about his view of human nature and particularly of the passionate character of human nature and then the calculations that grow out of that. Um, with regard to the way in, in which that, um, in which his view of nature plays into his you know, famous economy between fortune and virtue. Uh, if everything's always changing, Machiavelli doesn't imagine, I think, a world in which human beings can control everything, even themselves. So we're never going to be free from circumstance, luck, fortune, um, unanticipated consequences. But we don't have to just then give up because I mean, his whole life is, I think, or certainly his, his life and work as an author is devoted to trying to show his readers that there are regularities that you can observe, particularly in human behavior. And if you observe them, then you can design institutions that have better outcomes than the ones we now experience. So you know, there's no heaven or perfect solution at the end. There's no end of effort because nothing that you find that works for the time being is always going to work. But there are the things that do work for the time being, and that's what you want to discover. All right, thank you so much on behalf of all the members of the International Machiavelli Society. I'd like to thank you for an amazingly rich, um, indeed comprehensive uh, <laughs> presentation of Machiavelli. So thank you very much indeed. Awesome.